we're now going to begin talking about things with multiple quantifiers and interpreting them and also negating them. So for each of these, I'm going to explain in English, maybe not write it down, but at least explain in English what it's trying to say. This first one says that for every single rational number, there is a real number that when you add it to it, you get zero. This is true because you, there is an additive inverse is what we call this. This exists in the rational numbers. I actually could have made this statement better by saying there exists a Y in the rational numbers and it would still be true, but I said the real numbers and that makes it also true. So it says determine the logical negation of that statement. So to do this, I mentioned this earlier, we talked about sliding quantifiers. We're going to say not for all X in the rational numbers. There exists a Y in the real numbers such that X plus Y is equal to zero. The way a lot of people visualize this is you slowly move the negation inside. So earlier we said the opposite of a for all is that there exists. So we change that for all X in Q into there exists an X in Q. And then the, there exists a Y, we're just gonna put the negation next to that and deal with it later. So we have, there exists a Q, and then we have not, there exists a Y in the real numbers, such that X plus Y equals zero. And now we're down to a problem that's more similar to the ones we saw before. So there exists a Q such that not that statement. So we change this to there exists an X in Q, such that for all, y in the real numbers, x plus y does not equal zero. So now it's much more like the problems we did before. So the, the original one was that for all and there exists, this one changes to there exists and for all. So just like you might imagine, every quantifier switches along the way. So you can think about sliding this in slowly, or you can just switch every quantifier as you go. I say that, but our next example is going to mean we need to be careful sometimes. For every single rational number, if there is a number that is the square of it, then you can take the square root. So it's saying if it is the square of something, then the square root is a also a rational number. This is very strange to say because if you notice, there's parentheses here to help clarify that. It's if this thing exists, then this other thing is true. So when we negate this, we're going to want to be equally careful. So the for all changes to there exists an x in the rational numbers. This statement looks like p which I'm highlighting in green, implies Q, which I'm highlighting in that orange. So the negation of P implies Q is P and not Q. So this is there exists an X such that, and we'll keep the same brackets, P, which is this there exists a Y in the rational numbers such that Y squared equals X and not the second statement. So radical x is not in the rational numbers. And now we can actually de-parenthesize this a little bit, just like we could when we did predicate logic. When you have just a bunch of quantifiers back to back like this that are all the same, you can simplify it. So this would be that there exists an x and there exists a y such that one is the square and the other thing isn't a not a rational number. So we can actually get rid of these parentheses just like we saw before. So we get rid of the parentheses, and now this comma is also no longer necessary. Not necessarily obvious, and I'm not going to require people to make those simplifications, but with the order of operations, you can actually simplify this. In general, it's probably better to keep parentheses just to be safe, especially when implications are involved, which is why those original parentheses and brackets were all there to make it non-ambiguous. Our next example is going to be Fermat's last theorem, which states is going to start using universes of discourse, which allows us to be a bit lazier in our notation. It says for every a, b, c, and n greater than or equal to zero, this equation doesn't have a solution, which actually turns out to be true. It took us forever to prove this, hundreds and hundreds of years. Fermat is famous for having said that he has a proof of this theorem, but it was too big to fit in the margins of his book. The actual proof is hundreds of pages and involves several fields of mathematics that did not even exist at the time of writing that statement. So it's unlikely he actually had a proof of this. It was very famous. It was proved in the early 2000s, I believe, by Andrew Wiles. So it's a very famous theorem. This is how you write it down formally. Effectively, it says that the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, two is a special number. Having said all of that, now we just need to negate it. I'm going to explain how we can do this fast. We have four quantifiers back to back. So we change all of them. There exists, there exists, there exists, and there exists. So right this says there exists 
an A, there exists a B, there exists a C, there exists an N greater than or equal to 2, such that the negation of the inside, the opposite of a does not equal, is an equal. So A to the N plus B to the N is equal to C to the N. Notice I didn't change the inequality associated with N. The reason is that that's a specifying a domain. It's not saying it's in a set, but it is saying that n comes from a special area. So it's not the set notation, but it's meaning the same thing. You're specifying where it comes from. Also notice we specified a universe of discourse in this problem. That means a, b, and c, because I didn't say where they came from, we assume that they are integers. This is another way to make these problems simpler to look at. Writing that a, b, and c are all integers makes this really clunky to look at. But if you just know they're integers, move on. It's a lot nicer, right? The next one is another famous statement. I can never remember the name of this. I think it's the Goldbach conjecture, but it's saying that every single integer is the sum of two prime numbers. So to negate this, we would again negate all the quantifiers. So there exists an integer such that for all prime numbers p, and for all prime numbers q, that x does not equal p plus q. Many people believe this to be true, but it hasn't been proven. It seems like a really obvious thing, right? Every number can be written as two prime numbers. It seems like it should be really straightforward to prove. Turns out it's very, 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 very difficult. So some mathematical statements which seem simple or obvious might be effectively impossible or very, very, very difficult to prove.